I'm Kate Matthews, Time Accolades Editor, and today I am joined by Reshma Sajani, the founder of Girls Who Code. Reshma, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Kate, for having me. There will soon be a new record number of female CEOs leading Fortune 500 companies, 38 to be exact, or about 8%. As someone who has made building girls' leadership skills a central part of your mission, what is your reaction to that number? So I think when you hear the number, it sounds promising, but I think we need to dig in. Only three out of the 38 are women of color, and none of them are Black and Latinx. So from my perspective, I think we just have so much further to go. What do we lose or what do we risk when women don't have parity in the boardrooms and the Zoom meetings where big decisions are being made? So I think that diversity is so key to innovation. You know, it's why that at Girls Who Code, we've been striving to, you know, get to gender parity in technology. You simply are not going to make good decisions if you don't have women around uh, the table. I, I want to give you like two examples I always use. One is a little silly and one serious. So I love to wear big hoops. I'm not wearing them now. But when I have my Apple earpods on and I have my hoops on, what do you hear? Clink, clink, clink. It's clear that nobody who built those AirPods wore hoops because they would have thought that from a design perspective that uh, you want to account for that. Um, a more serious example, my students always remind me that a use of Google Home and Alexa is by perpetrators of domestic violence, where they use those products to turn the music up real loud or to lock women out. Again, because we don't have people around the table who experience domestic violence, they couldn't have thought that the product could be used in that way. So everyday innovations are being made. Everyday companies are being built. Everyday decisions are being made and we're not sitting around the table and it's affecting us and it's dangerous and it's harmful to women and people of color. What role can male tech leaders and male programmers play in making their workplaces more equitable? Oh, so much more. I mean, 50% of girls who code teachers are men. There are dads every day who send their young girls and you know to our program because they want a better world for them. They want a better life for them. They want them to know that they can be anything and everything. And so we need men, we need male allies as part of the movement. I gave a talk recently about you know what does brave not perfect mean for men? And one of the one of the best things that I saw uh, about two years ago when I was um, you know brave not perfect was coming out, I had visited the Rochester Institute of Technology. And I wanted to meet with them to understand like why their numbers of women in computing were going up. What were they doing that was working? And as I was speaking to the women in computing group, there were a group of guys that were sitting around the table. And afterwards, I went up to them and I said, who are you? And they're like, we're the men who support the women in computing group. They had formed a club inside a club because they knew that the women in their field had it harder than them. So when there was a microaggression in a classroom, they said something. When they went to an interview at a big tech company and they were, you know, they came back and told the other women what questions to expect. They were there to provide information, to provide knowledge, to provide support. And so I think that that's what that means. Like, what does bravery mean for men? It means recognizing your privilege. It means recognizing the fact that there isn't a meritocracy. Right. And that there are so many women in the room who are smarter than you, who can do it better than you. Give them space. Men speak 80 percent more than women in meetings. So I always say to men, you know what? Give us a beat. Just be quiet. Don't throw your hand up in the air. Give us a minute. Right. Because if we can't articulate, if we can't have the space to share our thoughts and our views, we'll never be able to participate. So Girls Who Code, your organization, has gotten a lot of attention for its efforts to engage and excite and educate young girls about programming. But fixing the STEM pipeline, as you just observed, um, in, reg in regards to male allyship, is a complex undertaking. What are some issues that women face as they try to succeed in STEM fields that are less recognized or, or less addressed? Um, and how might we fix it? Look, I still think that we think that we have a meritocracy in tech. I think that we still act like all nerds are welcome. And that is simply not true. You know, before this global ep epidemic, we were starting to really make a tremendous amount of progress in having women graduate in with computer science degrees. When I launched Girls Who Code, less than 13% of those who were graduating uh, with computer science degrees were women. You know, by the end of last year, many schools, it was almost at 38, 39%. But if you looked at major tech companies, the numbers of women were still, and the numbers of women of color, forget about it. 
right? Women of color, less than 2%, black and Latina women. Uh, for women generally, it was still in the 15 to 16%. We hadn't made progress. So you had this enormous talent pool coming out of the schools that they prioritized, whether that was MIT or Stanford or Carnegie Mellon, but they still weren't hiring them because in their minds, all nerds were welcome. They didn't have a racism problem. They didn't have a discrimination problem. Women simply were not making it through the interview process. And that's because they just weren't ready yet. Well, I call BS on that, right? Because you have plenty of qualified women, you know, who are out there who people are able to hire, but you're not hiring them. And so I implore technology companies today to look deeply into your process, to examine it, to analyze it, to criticize it, and to be critical of it, and to assume that you know there is racism everywhere, and to do the work on anti-racism, to do the work on anti-sexism, and to you know start really holding yourself accountable. You know, at Girls Who Code, I have a number. I want half of my students to be black and Latina X. I want half my students to be under the poverty line. Every year when I finish that year, I, I do an audit of myself. How did we do? And if we didn't get our numbers, we do better. But I hold myself accountable and I want companies to hold themselves accountable. If the needle is not moving, it's on them. It's their fault because the talent is there. It's not a pipeline problem anymore. And we have to stop talking about it that way. So speaking about those processes that you mentioned, one barrier to women rising to the top of their organizations is the so-called double shift, which is when women who have just put in a long day at work come home and they are responsible for a disproportionate amount of care work and housework. And during the pandemic, as many of us are doing all of these things simultaneously, the, the result has been even more challenging for many women. How are you addressing this issue even within your own organization at Girls Who Code? I always say uh, perfectionism is alive and well in the pandemic. You thought it would die, but no, we're still like, you know, turning off video on our Zoom calls when our dog or our, our kids walk in or turning off the audio. We still feel like it is a reflection on us and our leadership. And we're not crazy for feeling that way because there is a double standard for women. You know, my son, I have a five-year-old son. He will still interrupt me over he interrupts my husband, Nahal. You know, I'm still doing laundry, you know, in between my Zoom calls. I'm still, you know, uh, making puree, right? Cleaning the house. Like by the end of the day, I am exhausted. And I always say like, you can't be brave if you're tired. You're not going to raise your hand for that assignment. You're not going to launch that company. You're not going to launch your run for office if you are simply exhausted and women are exhausted. So look, the vast majority of my leadership team is female and have kids under the age of eight. I made a commitment to myself that I am not going to lose anyone, no one, not one female leader in this pandemic because my team is incredible. But I know them, like me, I have kids, a son who's starting kindergarten in public school. This September is going to be a nightmare. And, you know, this fall is going to be a nightmare. The spring was a nightmare for us, for working parents. It is true. It's almost like you can't be a working mom and have a child in the pandemic. But I don't, I want to make that. I don't want that to be the case. So I think I'm thinking in every day, I started thinking in July and August and talking to my people and culture team and strategizing and having one-on-one -on -one meetings. What do you need? What can I do to support you? How can I help you? Because you know what? You have my commitment. And I hope every single CEO out there is sitting down with their working moms and having this conversation. So they know that their job is going to be there for them that they're not gonna be evaluated because there is this double shift, there is this reality. And if we want to make sure that we don't lose the progress that we've made for women in the workforce, and until we fight for pay equity and affordable daycare, and we fix all the things that are wrong in our broken structure, it is up to us as CEOs and organizations to make it possible for women to not just survive, but to thrive. So I actually, you mentioned your son. I read that while you were filming a promotional book for a promotional video for your book, Brave Not Perfect. He wandered into frame um, and you decided to go with that take as is. Can you tell me about that moment and why you decided not to reshoot? So um, my paper book came out in the middle of COVID. Uh, I was so excited to see it in airports and in bookstores and everywhere. It was nowhere except in a box, like, you know, on my porch, right? 
And so I had to do a video releasing my paperback. And so this is like the one moment that I have. And of course, like my son comes up, grabs the book and like throws it like at my husband, who is, you know, my, my cameraman in the house right now. Um, and I just laughed and went with it because you know what? Everything is a mess right now. Everything is messy. My son is on every single shot. Like I am literally, I'm down here normally in my basement interviewing amazing women from like Hillary Clinton to Jill Biden and, and men, Jack Dorsey. And nine out of 10 times, he's going to knock on this window, right? He's going to come in with his Power Rangers outfit on. He's going to ask me for an Oreo. And you know what? It's gonna, it's going to, it's going to, it's, it's a mess, but you know, I'm going with it because that's life. So what is your message to people, especially parents who are having that experience and who feel like they're underperforming during this time? Mm. Listen, your only job is to stay alive, to literally stay alive. Everything else is bonus. So I'm not trying to learn how to play the guitar. I'm not baking sourdough bread, right? I am, I literally don't feel bad when I lock myself in my room and eat a chocolate chip cookie at night to hide from my kids because that's like my one solace. Um, our only job is to literally just survive. I'm going to have to try that chocolate chip cookie trick. <laughs> it works. I swear by it every night. So, and this is a little bit of a topical shift, but um, in early June, as protests for social justice spread across the country, you released a statement that tied the underrepresentation of women uh, of color um, in the tech industry to a wide range of issues, including police brutality and voter suppression and pay inequity. How do all of these separate issues connect and how do they influence each other? Yeah, I mean, in it, I said that the lack of women and people of color is not separate from pay inequity, which is not separate from the wealth gap, which is not separate from the healthcare gap, which is not separate from voter suppression, which is not separate from police brutality, which is not separate in the way that this pandemic has disproportionately affected communities of color. We live in an unequal society where Black and Latino people face more inequity than anyone else. And so when I started Girls Who Code, this was the thing I wanted to fix. You know, my parents came here as refugees with nothing. And the only reason why I'm standing here today is because of education, because my family had a chance at the American dream. And I often question whether that dream is alive and well for others. You know, I have students who are today getting Wi-Fi in Burger King parking lots, who are opting to not start college because they're worried about getting sick and getting COVID and bringing it home to their mothers and their fathers who are black because we know that this virus is disproportionately affecting black people. And so, you know, we have so much to change and so much to fix uh, and so much to fight for. And that's our work at Girls Who Code. So beyond hiring more equitably, what changes can tech leaders make to be a part of the change that they wanna see? I mean, I think tech leaders, uh, I think Jack Dorsey is a great example of this. Like he is really putting his money where his mouth is and he is putting money into organizations, into causes, into movements. You know, we are entering an incredibly turbulent time where our country is more divided than ever before. And so we need tech leaders to step up and to speak out. You know, there are so many nonprofit organizations that are going through turmoil right now you know, have lost resources, you know, have had to make serious layoffs, whose work is in jeopardy. And now is the time for people to really stand up and dig deep into philanthropy and to, you know, to continue to give and give more um, and to continue to make sure that, you know, in, in our case, that like more so than ever before, every girl has to learn how to code. Right. Like our industry, industries are shifting. Jobs are shifting. We are going to have more higher unemployment than we've ever had. These are the jobs of the future. And we have to make sure that no children are left behind. And we're going to have to count on every single leader, whether you're in the public sector or the private sector, to make that happen. Like most other educational programs, Girls Who Code pivoted its programming to virtual learning instead of in-person instruction. But virtual learning, of course, emphasizes some existing inequities. For example, some students may not have access to the same devices that other students do. How is Girls Who Code adjusting to meet the needs of its individual students? Yeah, so when this pandemic started, you know, Girls Who Code taught 300,000 girls. We have 10,000 Girls Who Code clubs 
across the country. We run 85 summer immersion camps and we have 150 college loops. Colleges were closed, tech companies were shut down, and schools were closed. So every single place where we taught was no longer open to us. And we quickly gathered as a team and we said, all right, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna take a pause? Or are we gonna make sure that like no crisis is ever wasted? And we use this as an opportunity to double down, to teach more girls, to teach more underserved girls. And that's exactly what we did. We began converting our Girls Who Code clubs into virtual clubs. Our renewal rates are higher than they've ever been. Instead of teaching 1,300 girls inside tech companies, we taught 5,000 girls virtually from all across the country. And we sat there and we said, okay, we see that school districts are a huge panic right now because many kids are who don't have Wi-Fi, you know, don't have devices, are simply just not logging on to school. How can we design a virtual summer program that is for them, that is for that young girl, you know what I mean, who's sitting in public housing, who doesn't have a computer, who doesn't have Wi-Fi? How do I reach her? And how do I how do I make sure that by the end of two weeks, she has learned how to code. She's learned how to build a website or an algorithm. And so we designed it for her. And that's what I think was our big success because we sent kids hotspots, right? We sent kids devices. We designed a program that was synchronous and asynchronous. We made sure that teachers met with students before so they actually got to know them. We put them into groups where they can actually connect. And what was so powerful was that we taught 5,000 girls and they had the most amazing experience and in our program, every student gets to build something, right? About like a problem that they're facing. And whether the girls were in Utah, Arkansas, you know what I mean, Kansas, you know what they wanted to build? They wanted to build a tool to support the Black Lives Matter movement. And these are white girls, Asian girls, poor girls, rich girls, trans girls, right? Like all across the board, there was this common sense from our young girls that I need to do something to fix and help society, that I am being called to change it. And it was the most awe-inspiring, powerful experience that I have ever been a part of. Um, and so I think that even though we are in the middle of this global pandemic and there's going to be remote education happening everywhere, we can do it right. We can do it right. But again, we have to design for the most vulnerable. You ran for Congress in 2010, reflecting on some of the more recent developments, such as congressional hearings with tech industry giants and the legislative response to COVID-19. What do you think would be the potential impact if Congress itself became more inclusive, not just of more women and more people of color, but also more specifically of more scientists and programmers and educators and doctors? What would that look like? Yes, it would look great. I mean, it would look great. I find myself often screaming at the television um, because, you know, we have a lot of people in Congress who, you know, aren't comfortable with technology, who don't really understand what the future is going to look like. And so they don't, they don't go deeper, right? Whether it's our tech CEOs or in thinking about, you know, what are the issues that we're going to see in the next 20 years? And so we need more people with that lens, with that experience. Like my biggest concern is, is inequity. You know, when I started Girls Who Code, I was so excited because I was like, you know what, whether you're rich or poor, none of our girls know how to code. And so everybody is behind. But what this crisis is showing us is that we are doing such a huge disservice to our children and we are going to lose decades of learning, right, if we don't get this right. And we're not having a conversation about, you know, how to have, you know, high speed internet in every single person's home. We're not having a conversation about devices. We're not having a conversation about how to accommodate and to create tech literacy and, you know, productive remote learning environments for our children. And they are going to be left behind. And so I want somebody who's like, you know, calling, you know, like basically like screaming on the top of their lungs on Capitol Hill and saying like, we need to act and we need to act now. What is giving you hope in this moment? Uh, our young people, our young people and our leaders. I mean, leaders like AOC and Ayanna Presley, you know, leaders like Michelle Obama, right? Truth tellers, you know, the ones who aren't afraid to get into the arena, the ones who aren't afraid to, you know, to not be perfect and who are brave. I'm inspired by our young people. 
you know, I'm inspired by the people, who, you know, Black Lives Matter, Lives Matter was started by young black women, you know, the climate change started by young people. Like, I always say it's like young people who are going to heal us right now. You know, young people ask me all the time, what should I do with my life? You know, colleges are closed, like school, what should I do? And, you know, I, I always say it's like, you know, it's very clear, like we, you have inherited a broken and divided nation. You are in a moment now where our leaders are behaving like children and you children are our leaders. So lead us, heal us, save us. And I have no doubt that they will. When I watched protest after protest after protest happened after George Floyd's murder, it was young people who were out there putting their bodies on the line in the middle of a global health crisis to be truth tellers and to push our country and our nation to be just, fair, and equitable. And I don't think that that's changing anytime soon. Thank you so much, Reshma, for joining us today on Time 100 Talks. Thank you so much for having me.